Welcome back to the Startup Showdown podcast, where we discuss pitching, funding, and scaling startups. Join us as we interview winners, mentors, and judges of the monthly $120,000 pitch competition powered by Panoramic Ventures. We also discuss the latest updates in software, Web3, healthcare tech, fintech, and more. Now sit tight as we interview this week's guests and their journey through entrepreneurship. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Startup Showdown, and this is going to be a fun one. Today on the show, we have Kim Seals, and she is with The Jump Fund. Welcome, Kim. Hi, Lee. How are you? I am doing well. I'm so excited to learn what you're up to. Tell us a little bit about The Jump Fund. Sure. Happy to do it. Uh, The Jump Fund is what we would call a micro VC, which means we're a smaller size venture capital firm. We're focused on investing in uh, gender diverse, uh, women led startups here in the Southeast. Uh, We uh, invest across all industries. So it's really about are you headquartered in the Southeast? Are you uh, do you have a gender diverse leadership team? And then after that, it's very traditional early stage startup metrics as we look to decide if we'll make an investment or not. Uh, We started back in 2013. And in that time, since then, we've invested in over 30 startups around the Southeast in just about every industry. Uh, So we are really excited about the progress we've made in our goal to get more capital in the hands of, of female entrepreneurs. Now, what's your backstory? How'd you get involved in this line of work? It, it's actually a, a little bit of a different path. I'm not, uh, I don't have a background in finance or investment or anything like that. I actually have a background in HR and talent strategy. And uh, back in 2013, I was at Mercer and we, uh, Mercer is a large global HR consulting firm. We were doing some work with the World Economic Forum at that point on the mission around keeping more women in the workforce on par with men. And as I was uh, looking at some of the research that Mercer did in conjunction with the World Economic Forum and was showing the real economic imperative behind this, really the ability to affect the GDP of countries, if you can get and keep women in the workforce on rates on par with men, I started looking to see, you know, was is anyone really solving this problem? Where were women going when they were leaving the workplace? And what I saw pretty clearly was many of them were leaving to start their own businesses and becoming entrepreneurs as, you know, maybe there was some frustration with what was happening in in traditional corporate roles. Uh, Maybe they needed the more uh, flexibility to be calling their own shots, whatever it might be. But women were starting companies at rates even higher than men, but they weren't getting the funding. And I started looking at how I could be a part of helping to solve that problem and started becoming uh, doing investing on my own as an angel investor through Golden Seeds up in New York. And it was there that I met uh, one of my fellow Jump Fund partners, Christina Montague, who was also looking to solve the same problem. And she was looking to start a fund here in the Southeast. Uh, so she asked me if I would get involved and in, uh, invest some money in the fund, you know, help uh, take some of my HR background, uh, help coach some of the entrepreneurs that we were investing in. Uh, because one of the things we, we know is a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs are first time founders. They uh, don't really know how to grow and scale a company. You do a lot of that through your people strategy, who you hire. And it was just on from there, Lee. I mean, it, it, again, it was a very non-traditional path into becoming an investor myself, but I, I really enjoyed it over the last, um, what are we, going on nine years now, and uh, and really have found that my background in HR and talent strategy has been an, an interesting add to our team uh, as we look at the, the entrepreneurs that we're investing in, and then how do we coach them uh, through the lifetime of our investment. Now, you mentioned uh, that there was some research that was part of, um, I guess, the impetus for you to pursue this. Can you share a little bit about that and, and, the, and share a little bit about the disparity about how many women-owned firms get funded versus men? Um, because I think it is eye-opening and not everybody is aware of, of those kind of statistics. You probably don't have them all off the top of your head, but you probably have kind of general ballpark idea of what sure. they are. 
Sure, absolutely. In the last uh, several years, there's been a lot of even some more updated tracking since what I was talking about back in the day. And, you know, the numbers are still pretty grim, right? If you look at uh, the total amount of venture capital dollars that get allocated, it's still something disappointing, like less than 3% of that money goes to women-led organizations. And, uh, you know, that's that's really the, the problem that we've been trying to solve. And we're trying to help uh, these uh, female founders get access to capital in a way that they have not been able to, to do traditionally. If you look at angel investment dollars, the numbers are better, right? Uh, so maybe 20%, I think was the last Last number I saw close to 20% of investment dollars of angels go to women-led companies. But when you're in more traditional VC, it's still a very small number. And then when you add on uh, the component of race and you look at black founders, uh, the number is even smaller. Like, I think it's somewhere around 1%. So, you know, we, um, we're pretty passionate about helping to solve this problem and helping these founders find the capital they need because on the flip side, the data also shows that women-led companies are outperforming and uh, are very uh, capable of becoming big, scalable startups that deserve this investment. And that's um, where the rubber hits the road in, this, in the <laughs> business, right? Where the ROI of investing in women is very good and really doesn't warrant the lack of investment if people just go by the numbers. That's right. And, and part of the way to solve this problem is to get more women check writers, uh, because we know that women get a, a more a direct, more thorough look at their, uh, at their startup or investment when there are women in the mix uh, that are helping to evaluate these companies. Uh, because not always, but many times women are solving problems and challenges that directly impact women. You know, we, uh, and what we see is if you don't have women in there listening to your pitch, you may be missing that perspective of, of really how big is this problem? Who, who wants to pay you to solve this problem? How big is that total addressable market? Uh, so when you're dealing with, with some of that, you, you can get uh, eliminate some of those biases of perhaps the audience you're pitching to not understanding your, your product solution company. And, uh, you know, so I think certainly it, when we're talking about companies that are solving problems that, that target women, uh, it's certainly helpful to have women in the room listening to the pitch. Right. Uh, at the jump up, at the jump up, we have invested in companies beyond that. We've invested in clean tech energy, 3D shoe printing, uh, medical device. Um, but a, again, it, it is a, a, a part of the problem that there aren't enough women out there that are check writers. Right. I've had the pleasure to interview uh, some women that are involved in the femcare um, and then they weren't getting funding because it wasn't on the radar of a guy. It, like yeah. it was something that it's, they don't even want to think about it. And they, so they're just passing where a woman's like, Oh, that's a real problem. This is something uh, this is like so obvious. Thank you for sharing. Like it's a big, <laughs> it's a t totally different way of looking at it, but the yeah, guy I mean, doesn't have that perspective and the woman lives it so that it's real. Like the, this is, yes. it, it, that's why it's important to have everybody in the room and have that representation. Yeah, I'll give you one more data point, Lee, that really backs up what you're saying, which is uh, every buy decision in every household, at least 85 to 90% of the time is made by a woman. And when you're talking about healthcare related decisions, that number goes up exponentially into the high 90s. Uh, so, you know, if, if women are your buyer, um, and then You've got to know more about that perspective. And, uh, you know, so it, it just tells you that we should be looking at how this money is getting allocated. And are we missing the real opportunity for a, a big ROI on our investments if we were investing in more women led companies? Right. And it doesn't it's not it doesn't have to be a oh, that's a nice thing to do. It's a good business thing to do. Like that's right. it's it's great that you have a kind of a female led fund that's all in in this and that's super important, but it should be it shouldn't be unusual. It no, should be it part of all funds. <laughs> it should and and I'll, um, I'd say I think it's probably close to now 85 to 90% of our LP base are actually women as well. So we went after uh a thesis that women would invest in this asset class and women would invest in other women as another way to also uh, make that proof point that, you know, it, you should be in, engaging more women as entrepreneurs, as investors, as LPs, uh, that, you know, women are, uh, they play an important part in this entrepreneurial ecosystem. Right. And, and it sounds like you're taking kind of a big role in building out this community. 
we, we have been, uh, we were, I think, one of the first funds to come in and focus exclusively on women. We are seeing more do that now. And, uh, you know, it was, but back when we were doing it in 2013, we were getting a lot of feedback that it, our focus was too narrow. Uh, we were cutting ourselves off from good deals by only looking at women-led companies. Uh, we were told we wouldn't find investors. So, you know, we're pleased to be sitting here, um, you know, nine years later with um, exits under our belt and having successfully deployed capital across two different funds. Now, you mentioned some of the industries you're in. Uh, are you like kind of totally industry agnostic? Um, we are. Uh, you know, there are some industries where we feel like we don't have a, a, a lot of expertise, like, you know, food and beverage. That's one we kind of tend to stay away from. But yeah, if people want to go to our website, uh, thejumpfund.com, uh, our portfolio companies are all out there. They can take a look at them and, and they can see we're in fintech, healthcare tech, uh, energy, um, you know, tr- traditional software as a service. We're in HR and talent type uh, spaces. So we really have invested pretty broadly across uh, many of the industries. So now when you're talking to a founder, what is, are some of the kind of... Uh, green lights and red lights and yellow lights like what do you like to see what is kind of turn off for you where you're like ah, this is not going to be a good fit uh can you share a little bit of that for the people who are founders that are listening sure uh you know obviously we want to see companies that can grow and scale to be bigger companies so we do look at the market opportunity we look at the market size total addressable market so we have you know very standard criteria around there we want to see traction. We want to see some proof points that that the problem that you're solving is one that people will pay you to solve. Um, but the, but when we look at the founder and their team, we want to make sure that you have a um, coachable, capable leadership team. We want to make sure that you understand the numbers and the financial metrics around your business. One of the red flags for me is if we are talking to a founder who. Uh, doesn't understand the economics of their business. So when we say, you know, what is the business model? How will you make money? What do you think is happening with your expenses? What do you see as your forecast over the next couple of years? If we have a founder who who, uh, can't speak uh, in detail and with uh, a level of confidence about those financial projections, that's one of those red flags for us uh, that, you know, would make us pause and say, is this the right uh, um, entrepreneur for us to invest in? Now, is that, do you have as part of your community or your ecosystem a place for that person who maybe just isn't ready for you, but has their heart in the right place and has, you know, the desire, but maybe just isn't there yet from a, um, you know, skill set in terms of ready to launch a business and have a conversation with investors? Sure. I mean, there, uh, if I think about just Atlanta alone, uh, there are so many great resources here in Atlanta for someone who's just starting out who needs more coaching and needs to get ready to uh, to to uh, and learn more about their business before they're ready to take outside investors. Um, we are at the Jump Fund an investor in a, comp- in a uh, fund called the Fearless Fund. And this Fearless Fund has a, um, a program called Get Venture Ready. And that's exactly what their purpose is, is to take in um, and in fact, they're sp- specifically focused on women of color who have started businesses and helping them get the grounding business principles they need and learn more about how to grow and scale their business before they ever start taking on outside funding. Uh, so programs like that, um, Atlanta Tech Village has programs, uh, or, you know, they have a whole summer school program that has a, a nice curriculum that, that helps you with some fundamentals uh, as you're looking to, to um, start your business or grow your business. Uh, ATDC, um, the city of Atlanta has the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative, where they uh, select 15 female entrepreneurs and put them in a 15-month cohort and help them uh, learn some, uh, some of the things they may not be as uh, well versed in that they need to know to be tr- to move from that founder to that CEO role. Uh, so, a number of different resources that we will refer entrepreneurs to if we feel like they're too early for us. And then we'll track them. We'll say, add us to your distribution list. Keep us posted on the progress of your company. And who knows, we we might come back around again and uh, be ready to make an investment later on. Now, how did you find out about Startup Showdown um, and Panoramic Ventures? How did that get on your radar? Uh, We are co-invested with Panoramic in a couple of deals. So I know the team over there, know them pretty well. And uh, they reached out and asked me if I would be a judge in one of their sessions. I, I believe it was late last year, and uh, it was a great experience, and I was happy to do it. 
Now, any advice for a founder that's going through an event like Startup Showdown? Are there kind of some do's and don'ts you can recommend them uh, for them? You know, I think it's really important that you take advantage of the opportunity uh, to be in this uh, in this program because there's some mentoring and coaching that happens as they are looking to select those top uh, companies that actually make it to the startup showdown. So uh, I think that's important to to um, to do those mentoring sessions to learn that you're meeting some really interesting people that have donated their time to to help coach you. So I, I really do encourage folks to uh, to do that. And the second thing I'll encourage you is practice your pitch because you've only got a very brief amount of time. You need to be really concise and thoughtful about what you're saying when you're up there pitching and how do you convey the really the important details of what we need to know about your company so that you're positioning yourself to win to win the startup showdown. Now, having you mentioned earlier that you're coming from a kind of a non-traditional path into this world, is there anything about your background um, that is maybe a superpower of yours that is different than uh, some of the other folks that are in this industry? Well, I think it's the piece around HR and talent strategy and my ability to, to coach the entrepreneurs as they're looking to bring on new talent. Many times we invested in, this, in these companies when they were much smaller, maybe two, three, four people. And we have some that have now grown to be over 50, 60 people. And we have, and it's been great along the way to really help uh, help them think through, through their people strategy. When, when do they need to bring on new talent? What kind of new talent? How are they finding the best talent? How to navigate uh, sometimes when you're not able to pay market competitive uh, salaries because you're also giving equity in the company. So I think my superpower has been my ability to work with those entrepreneurs on their talent strategies as they're thinking about hiring, um, growing and scaling their company through people. It's, it's one of the most important things they'll do. Now, for the Jump Fund, uh, what do you need more of? How can we help? Uh, we are currently focused on helping our existing portfolio get their next round of funding. So I would say if you um, take a look at our portfolio companies, anybody listening, and it goes out to our website, and you think you can help make introductions to later stage venture capital, we're, we're still trying to buck you know, bust through those walls, if you will, and get more capital in uh, for our entrepreneurs as they continue to grow as they're doing their Series A and their Series B. So that's predominantly what our focus is right now is we have a lot of companies out there continuing to raise money. Uh, we, as an early stage investor, a lot of times we're we're out for some of those later rounds, like the B round or the C round, but we still want to support and help coach uh, those entrepreneurs and make introductions for them as they're looking for those later stage venture capital dollars. Now, can you share a story about a founder maybe that you've worked with that you helped take to a new level that and maybe even it exceeded your expectations and theirs? Uh, you know, there's there's a, probably a few. Um, but, you know, I think, again, it's it's in terms of my personal impact, it really uh, is around uh, one of our companies just entirely replaced their C-suite. So they the founder is still there. But over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, realized that what got them to the point they were at now was not what they needed for the future. And I really uh, spent a lot of time with that founder thinking through what the new leadership team structure needed to be, what were the skills and capabilities that she needed to bring on in this new C-suite to bring in people who would complement her skills as the CEO. And I'm really proud of the work we did and the, and the team that, uh, that she has in place now is the team she needs uh, to take her to that next level. Well, congratulations on all the success. If somebody wants to learn more about the Jump Fund, uh, get on your calendar or your radar, uh, what's the website? Uh, www.thejumpfund.com or connect with me on LinkedIn and, uh, and send me a message there and we'll make it happen. All right, Kim. Well, thank you again for sharing your story. You're doing important work and we appreciate you. Thanks, Lee. All right, this is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Startup Showdown. As always, thanks for joining us and don't forget to follow and subscribe to the Startup Showdown podcast so you get the latest episode as it drops wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more and apply to our next Startup Showdown pitch competition, visit showdown.vc. That's showdown.vc. All right, that's all for this week. Goodbye for now.